Uh, I was thinking about what I was going to talk about today, you know, but I talk so much, I got a lot of stuff. One, I want to talk about box squats. I'm going to explain a lot of reasons why everyone should box squat. Uh, you know, if even an ex-Olympic, if you go overseas to Ukraine, I know all the Ukrainians and all the Russian powerlifters, they all squat wide. They don't squat close like Olympic lifters, they squat wide. And I'm going to talk about, from the very beginning, the original West Side Barbells in Culver City, California, they led the world. Uh, friend, you know, was a world record holder in a hammer throw, 56 pound weight throw. And at 242 in 1970, he squatted 854. He had an 816 deadlift. Oh, there's no one could rival that today, I'm sure. So it's all about box squats. That's why I learned how to do it. And, um, but we, we're going to make a short demonstration. Oh, we don't have a box. I'm going to have Phil here set on a box. Just show you. Don't go, don't go crazy wise. And hey, maybe come around here, Phil. Yeah. And then I'm going to go through why you should box squat. And I want questions. All right. And turn, turn, turn sideways, city. So Say, like, you turn sideways. Yeah. All right. This is how you box squat. It, you use two methods, static overcome by dynamic and relaxed overcome by dynamic. So uh, Phil is a world record holder in the squat. You always squat to slightly below parallel, which we don't have the yeah, ability to do this. Yeah, right. we would never do anything high. No, it's it's down. He releases the hips, flexes up. You notice, I mean, just for pure learning how to squat, what's the first thing that happens to Phil? He pushes his buttocks to the rear. No, just do it a little bit, but stop. So that's the first thing it moves. What's the last thing? The head. All right, sit down. Now on the descent. So what's the opposite of descent? Ascent. So what's the first thing it moves? The opposite of that, the head. If you push with your feet first, you will roll into a good morning. That's why you see so many people get squ hurt squatting. Box squats, I ruptured my patella tendon when I was 43 years old. I had an 821 squat. I, I wasn't going to live for five years, but uh, I came out of retirement. And when I did, at 52 years old, squatted 920, weighing 235, and uh, it was the third greatest squat out there. At all time, it was sixth greatest, at 52 years old. And I did it, I was able to train again because of box squats. We took a fellow, had a 749 squat in Florida, it was a 308, mostly ever squat 749, ruptured both patella tendons and the quadricep tendons. They put cadaver tendons in his knees, and he was all depressed. I told him to pull a sled and start jumping on a 2x12 as soon as he could. And then four inches and six, everything he told him not to do, I told him to do. And in four years, he squatted over 1,100 pounds. He started out, in five months he did 500. I said, that's good because that's what I did. But in nine months, he came to Columbus, Ohio for the WPO, and he says, can I take a workout? I said, yeah, go ahead. He squatted 890. Nine months after ruptured both patella tendons and the quadricep tendons, all from box squatting. That's what, it's the safest method. You know, you want to get the most out of exercises. Don't let them get the most out of you. All right. Questions on this? Anybody want to try it? Because I know you'll come up here and do it wrong. <laughs> yes, sir. So you basically just sit on the box and then... Uh, you sit on, you sit on the box. See, if you, when, when, when Phil sits back, all the muscles are pre-stretched. Just you stick your butt out there pre-stretched. The, keep the pressure in your abdominals. space the, the low oblique. You sit back. And then you flex your belly. Boom. You'll do that. That's wrong. Do you have like a pre, like a pelvic tilt into the squat? You don't roll into it, no. Mm -mm. You got to lock that back in. Everything has to be <clears throat> tight. Hey, okay, now let's face him. I mean, consider him up here. I can say what I want, I guess. All right, face this way, Fred. I mean, no, Phil, face him. Hey, when you squat, you know, you see all these injuries in, in, in girls' athletics? It's because they don't know how to, they don't know how to squat, truly. You know, everybody talks about uh, complicated Olympic lifting is, to this day, I started squatting, I was 14, I'm 59, they tell me how to squat every set. If you don't do something perfect, why do it at all? Every set, I am coached. And I'm coached by people squat over 1,000 and, and one over 1,100. Every set, I'm coached. You never push your feet down to squat. You push your feet out to the side. By pushing your feet out to the side, you shorten the femur. You also put the pressure here where it belongs. If you push down, you're pushing, putting, and invariably your knees will go forward. So you're going to put pressure on the patella tendon. But always push your feet out. And if you, uh, you, you don't play football, but if you, if you process, use that process, you'll stand up faster. That's why we use it to squat. So on a line, you'll get up faster. If you're coming out of a cross to throw, you're going to get up faster. And we're talking about a gentleman last night. Wider squats is hips. Hips is what squats. The larger, we've seen the larger leg muscles down around the knee, the worse the, worse the squatters are. Yeah. 
You have to have the hip. This is what does it all Add up here. Hips. That's right. Okay. All right. Why box squat? One, this is for, think about a lot of sports. It breaks up the eccentric, concentric chain. When you sit on the box, you relax. When you run, the only thing's doing is the foot on the ground, right? And also, um, come back over <laughs> And so it breaks up the eccentric, it causes you to go from, like a, a fighter doesn't fight like this, maybe I would, but they're relaxed. So they're relaxed and they could, that way they got speed on their punch. If you tighten up muscles, you have no stretch reflex, correct? All right, that's what this does. And, um, Oh, sideways. No, don't go nuts. But you'll notice when he squats, his shin is going to be passed straight up and down. The only way you can get up is literally leg curl yourself up. It's not like people think. For when Phil sits on this, to get up, he has to pull off his heel and literally leg curl himself up. All right? It takes the quadriceps out, and so you do supplemental work with belt squatting, where I talked about last night, belt around your waist. And you squat like that or a lot of sled pulls. But this is the way to get a huge jump, huge sprinting speed, or a huge squat. Okay. Like I said, it, it, it does two things. Static, some of the muscles are static, some are relaxed. So it's static overcome by dynamic and relaxed overcome by dynamic. You know, like me and this gentleman right here, we're in a pushing match. This is static. And all of a sudden he lets go. Boom. I just fly through him. Okay. That's sports. You, 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 uh, you know, you build up the power in your body and then let it go. All right, here's another thing. If you train on a 13 inch box, this is below parallel, 10,000 squats from now, you broke parallel every time. Everyone that does full squats, as the waist get heavier, they squat higher and higher. You know, to the point that they're doing a half squat. You see this in high school all the time. You have to do full range motions to become strong. If you actually squat uh, high all the time, it'll actually shorten the hip muscles and you won't be able to jump near side. It's been proven in basketball studies overseas. But every squat you do, you'll be able to, you will we'll break parallel if that's what you're after. And like um, Olympic lifters will bounce out of a squat where I have a, a fellow, he's 6'2", he's an 832 deadlifter, not that good a squatter, 940, and a 275s. This is a fellow can jump on a 35-inch box of 70-pound dumbbells. But he's actually squatted on a 6-inch box and you, totally relaxed with about a shoulder width stance. Okay. And I talked about, um, one thing I want to talk about, get into, is um, we were using a box. And Wilson has studies overseas that the stretch reflex, this, this works for a lot of athletes, will last two to four seconds. Anyone two, highly skilled athletes, four. With the, with the use of a Tendo unit, Dave Tate and I, Dave sat on the box for five seconds, I sat on it for eight and ten, and this is with sub, near maximum weight, circa max weights, uh, I got up at the same speed. Now, it, it really is a value to football teams um, for long counts because what people think it, would, it will maintain a stretch reflex. Where a full squat will not, if you go down, and a lot of people confuse pause squats with box squats, totally something different. If you go down a pause, you know, when you, uh, if you do a pause squat, you're, you're not moving, you're not stretching or contracting, all right? So that's a bad thing, because no way in the, on sports I ever see is that happening, because you rely on stretch reflex. You either switch in this way or switch in this way, or switch in that way, okay? One, uh, you have a l much less muscle soreness box squatting than you do full squatting. Uh, years ago, as a 181, when I got out of the Army, well, I was 14, I could squat 410. I got drafted, went in the Army, got out in 1970, and I could still squat 410. And I read about the Westside Barbell Club in Culver City about box squats. I said, well, I don't have anything to lose, you know. I'm not going anywhere like this. So I started box squatting. Three, I did it for three months, no squats. I did 450. I did it for three more. I squatted 500. And in early 1973, I squatted 630 in a meet, and they had no zero gear at 181, hour and a half way in. Plus, my deadlift went from 525 to 670 as a 181. And uh, that definitely helped. You know, a, another value of box squatting over full squatting. When you do one movement, if you full squat, you have to lower yourself. You have to stop yourself statically. You have to overcome it concentrically. You have three... Motion, you have three actions with one energy source. 
In a box squat, when you lower yourself, sit on the box, you can actually adjust yourself if you want. You can adjust your position and come up. That's why I'm talking about breaking an eccentric, concentric chain. So on the way down, I can gather as much energy as possible to jump up. That's why when we get off a box, they can squat so much more. And that, that's what you want. You want the least amount of weight to make you the strongest. Yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. Sorry. <laughs> So what is pausing and repositioning, how does that benefit us? Because if we don't stop in the power position in the throw, you, you, you have to stop somewhere in a still position. It builds explosive power. I trained Kevin Akins years ago, he threw 70-10, it's still, 20 years later, still the high state record. Kevin Akins box squat. I mean, the, the, the proof is in the methods. If you want to jump higher, like I talked about yesterday, a guy uses this process, of, he, he jumps on a 52-inch box on a regular basis. A fellow jumps on a 59 inch box after following his uh, 550 box squat, speed work, 315.8 meters per second. Jumped on a 59 inch box. It builds explosive power. These all came from Europe. These all came from track background. Didn't come from powerlifting, didn't come from Louis Simmons, it didn't come from Westside Barlboro and Culver City. It came from European track and field. When the track and field, when they would tour, they would tour the United States and they'd stop at Culver City. And I believe that's where board press came from in America, box squats came from, and many, many other things. I mean, you want, if you're going to do something for explosive power, like we do, we're going to do something that works the best, not second best. That's why we do it. Yes, how you're first. You the current height for box squatting, and how does that change over time? Well, we do a lot of low box squats, but I mean, basically in a power meet, this is the top of your knee, of course, and this crease here, this has to be slightly lower than the top of your knee. So that's how we position it. We also position it like, let's say, Phil squatted right here in the meet. All right? As the weights get, as we get going, we actually take the feet out. You, you end up slightly above parallel where you take out an inch mat sometimes if you're real flexible. But it isolates the power right here. Squatting is from here to here. That's where most jumping comes from. You know, posterior chain and then the hips. Yes? What's your rep scheme? Doubles. How many sets of doubles? We'll do as many as 12 sets of doubles. With, that's with, with no bands or chains, without a contrast method. If you use bands or chains, you, 10 sets is a lot. 10 sets isn't bad with chain, normally 8 sets with bands, because bands supply the overspeed eccentrics, and eccentrics is where muscular soreness uh, uh, comes from. And it's also like peak, the peak contraction theory every inch of the way. Much like a pec deck, the hardest thing in a pec deck is to start it, all right? Easy, the hardest thing in a leg press is to start it. It's easy to end, but with these bands, it's peak contraction all the way. So without the bands, what's the percentage of max? Uh, is this for just sports? Yeah. Uh, I would actually train at 50 to 60%. Oh, without, I would train, like I talked about yesterday, if you box squat and establish the record, train at 75, next week 80, next week 85. Three week pendulum wave and then roll back. If you, if you, any of you people are gifted, which I'm sure some of you are or were, you're not going to get any faster after three weeks. You're not going to get stronger. You have to use the pendulum wave. So fourth week, go back. Go back. Go back, but then that 75 percent is higher because you've gotten stronger in those three weeks. Hopefully, you probably should test yourself about every third wave, about every ninth week. Test yourself. Okay, or what we do is every third, every fourth week we change bars. We may front squat for three weeks. Now we have to use a harness. We can't front squat. We use a harness, the bar set here on the throat. Then we may use a safety squat bar for the next three weeks. Then we may use a straight bar. And every bar has a record, so the weights are going to change. The, the key to actually, pardon? Yeah, you bar squatting with a safety bar too? Absolutely. Okay. There's no squats in my gym. They're all box squats. I have nine people over 1,000 pounds, two over 11. Um, we lost a world record last weekend, but we, you know, we had the 220 world record, 10 and a quarter, 181, 905, 275, 11, 18. No full squats in my gym. It's like a bike. Once you ride it, you can, you can always ride it. Because box squats are so superior to full squatting, there's no, you know, it would be a downward step for us to full squat, so we don't do it. That's why we rely on sled dragging. Yes, sir. Uh, how often do you use bands versus uh, 
just straight weight versus chains? I mean, how do you how do you kind of cycle that? Okay, for our gym, we never use straight weight okay. because we're so explosive at the top. It's it's just not a good thing. It's too it's too easy. Right. Um, most we'll use bands 90 percent, nine out of ten workouts. We also use combinations. Um, if I can explain, obviously you do this. We use a lot of chain. My strong guys will use around 300 or 400 pound of chain and plus bands. So when they're coming up, the bands will, the chain will jump on abruptly. We call it abrupt loading. Right. All right. So right up, right below your mini max or your sticking point is going to hit you. And you know, you know, you got to be a complete idiot not to drive right through that. Once you know where something's hard, you're going to drive through it. If the snow's deep, you put your foot on the gas. <laughs> you know, same thing with the human body. So we do a lot like that. We also do a lot of stuff where we put a band, of course, around the bar. We also put a second band around the plates. Now this is tough. And see, every, if you use combinations and if you use chain, you have a three stage. You have to get through three mini maxes as it would be. And it teaches tremendous power in, in whatever position you want to situate the chain. Okay? More questions? Yes? When you're working, I don't, I don't know if you have any out there right now, when you're working with an Olympic lifter, are you still keeping their feet out wide when they're doing the bar squats or are you bringing them in more? Now? If I had Olympic lifters, we would have gold medals in America. I have the world's strongest gym, bar none. If I had Olympic lifters, I, I would like to hear the argument why I wouldn't have that. Absolutely. I, here's what I told Olympic lifters to do. Train box squats wide, test the squat with a front squat. That's what counts for them. If you look at Nam overseas, the Bulgarian, he, he routinely front squatted 5, 518. He had a 429 clean and jerk. He had such a vast amount of overpower. And over here, if you get a guy in front, you know, if he cleans 400, he's barely lucky to front squat 400. Is that true? You know, there's things called webs, and I'm sure all sports have them. If, if, uh, three things that make a clean jerk snatch go up. Power clean, power snatch, and a squat. The coefficient's almost exactly the same. You need to push those three up. Then you need to do special exercises for the, the cleans, the snatches, and the squat. That's what they, unfortunately, they don't do here. They use very few exercises that will not work. That's the law of accommodation. Re read it in any magazine, they'll tell you where they fail. Um, I could tell you this, like we said last night. Uh, if we wanted to challenge someone, if they challenge us with close hand squatting, we train wide. And we got some serious strong guys, you know, in gym trunks, it's going to squat around 900 for you. <laughs> you know, it's, it's, going to be, it's going to be ridiculous. Okay? Questions? Okay, I want to talk a little bit about, more about contrast training like I was talking about last night. I think this fits more into the college, you know, because you guys aren't power lifters, you're really not weight lifters. You know, you've got a lot, because a lot of throwers are stronger than Olympic lifters. You know, and I know it. And, but it's hard to take the punishment of what we do and do what you do. You can only be good at one thing. Remember, if you're a thrower, you've got to be a thrower. You know, I told people, I said, you're not a half-ass, you're a quarter-ass. You're not good at anything. You do a dozen things, you're not good at any of them. So, so who cares about that? <laughs> now, if you're the best at any one thing, I give you credit. I can't play ping pong, so the ping pong champion world, I give him credit. <laughs> so just think like that. You know, make sure you're training for your sport, not to be an Olympic lifter, not to be a power lifter. You're supposed to be a thrower. So got, make sure you and your coach get together, push everything toward the throws. Okay? Actually... What I did in 1983 when I brought my lord back for the second time and I was at my house for 17 weeks with no one saying anything but, gee, when you, uh, you're not going to lift no more. That's all I ever heard all my life. And um, I, I, I realized I got stronger, but I got slower. That's why I didn't break any records to the point I broke my fifth one by vertebrae. One, take out two discs, fuse my back, take off bone spurs. And I broke it in 73 as well. All right? That's how I invented the reverse hyper for familiar with that exercise, the machine. Anyhow, I, I realized that I got slower, so I took a page from Olympic lifting. I started doing dynamic method, developing a fast rate of force development. Here in America, if you want the Olympic lift to go up, you've got to make them stronger. You can only lift so much if you're only so strong. So they just need to do the opposite that I did. I took a page from them, but they don't want to take a page from, you know, the strength porches. Any questions? I want to talk about the lighting method. 
Now, in, in the old Soviet Union, you used the light method for junior lifters. We found our most advanced guys get the most out of it. And by, if you're not familiar with it, we'll t we take bands to the top of a power rack for like the deadlift. It goes up five foot six, a blue band, not choked. And on the ground, 135 actually weighs nothing. So let's say, let's say this fellow can, he can only squat 150 pounds. So you take one, he stands out with 135, sets in a full squat, it's zero, stands back up, it's 135. You follow on this? Okay, two and a quarter. Now on the bottom, it's 90 pounds. All right, but he stands up, it's two and a quarter. It's a contrast method. You're familiar with contrast training. That's what this is. We do a lot of this. Uh, for the squatting, for our guys, we use 200 pounds. It'll take 200 out of the hole in our monolith with a light band doubled up. A monster mini takes 110. And for instance, uh, we, our boy just squatted 1141, and he did 1150 off a box with 110 out of the hole. And he went to the meet and squatted 1141. So you see how we work things? Like if, if I got in a fight with this man, he beat me up. I'm not going to his house next week and let him beat me up again. I'm going to train for five or six weeks, figure out how to come to his house and maybe, maybe beat him up. You know, you just can't keep beating a dead horse. You, so that's what we, we don't like to get that psychological, like, like this girl, she's a thrower and she keep beating my girl. I wouldn't send my girl to her meets. I would keep my girl away from her meets. Till I built my girl up, then I'd show up and I'd try to kick her butt. I wouldn't let her get that psychological advantage on me. And humans can get a psychological advantage and so can weights. You know, I mean, oh, I hate to do it. I'm not doing that today. I hate to do it. Well, when someone says that, that's what they do in my gym. <laughs> they don't do what they want. They do what they need. Um, okay, the light method, you follow that. We also bench that way where we'll, we'll hang a band at the chest. Again, a blue band, if we use a blue band choked on a seven-foot rack, it's at the chest it weighs nothing. At lockout, it's 155. It'll take 155. A green band, a medium band, takes 95 off the chest, and a purple band takes 65. It teaches acceleration. In my opinion, the key to building extreme strength is to move the same amount of weight but at different speeds. So if you've got bands over top the bar, it's much different than putting bands cradled under the bar. You, you follow what I'm saying? You're lifting bar weight versus going into a band that has steadily increments of strength. Yes, sir? I don't think you just answered my question. Oh. I've done band squats where I've tied the lower bar up to the bar, and what you're saying is you tie them from the top down. That's right. So it's not really over speed eccentric. That's right. That's not. That's what I'm saying. It would, this fits, I think, more into you guys. If you were in my gym in you know, a year or two, it's no problem, but I th it would kill your athletes. So you, want, you all understand what I'm saying? Because he does. I want you to get up and tell him. Can you get up and tell him? <laughs> yeah. Um, I've had, I bought some bands back in August. Um, so you put the band where with the band you use, the the band, um, you, you tie them to the, down the ground on a dumbbell or a rack, and you pull it over the bar, so when you squat down, it, it overspeeds the eccentric phase of the lift. Now, I guess what you're saying is that you tie it from the top. Sorry. <laughs> tie to the top, that way 155 pounds would be floating in midair. You, fo you follow that, correct? Okay, everybody follow, okay. Yes, sir. Recovery. Uh, if you're in shape, which you better be, extreme workouts can be performed every 72 hours. Our squatting is on Friday. Our max effort for squatting and is on Monday. We use the same exercise for squatting and deadlifting. Our speed bench is on Sunday morning. Anyone's welcome to come by our gym, uh, ask the address because it's a private and it's not publicized. You're welcome to come by and watch the guys do speed work. And then max effort's on Wednesday. Extreme workouts every 72. Small workouts every 12 or 24. I train in the morning, so does Phil. We always work out that night too. We go back and do special work or, or skilled work. Like you people would go back and maybe do, instead of uh, GPP, general physical, you would do SPP. Special, special uh, physical you pyramids. Split it up? Pardon? You split it up in workouts? Uh... We do a complete workout in the morning, complete. Then we come back and do more that night. That's exactly what I'm doing when I come back. You only handle the barbell four workouts a week, two for speed, two for max effort. We live on our auxiliary work. If this gentleman here squats 500 pounds and he has 700 pound spinal rectors but 500 pound hamstrings, he's going to live on glued hams, reverse hypers, pull throughs, kettlebell swings, walking with sleds. See how this works? What about having a good morning? We, we live on good mornings. Uh, just don't, if someone's doing good morning with the deadlift, believe you me, you're doing way too much. The, the weightlifters would normally use around 70% for th three or four sets of six. 
You want to do, when you train direct lower back exercises, direct lower back, you should handle weights you can at least do for 10 reps. Your lower back is comprised of nothing but ligaments and tendons. You know, if you've ever torn a pec or something, you bleed, you black and blue. You tear a lower back, it never bleeds. If you blow a tendon off, it doesn't bleed. Why? Low blood supply. So when you train your lower back, you have to train it frequently. You know, if the Soviets trained their lower back five, six times a week, well, I'm from the same planet they are, and I, could, and, at my, and I do it, so they can, you can too. Yeah, you just do it systematically. Yes, sir. So and, and I, I've actually done both, the, the way you're talking about with the bands, you know, and, and I've noticed what you said, that like you get a lot sore with the, if the bands are, yeah. with the lightning method, I think it'd be better in terms of like during the season, Great. stuff like that. Great, yeah. you heard it from a coach. You agree with me. Right. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's, even, the, even if, you, you know, the weight at the top pretty much is the same, whether it's with the band and, and lower bar weight or all bar weight, it just seems for some, like you said, because of the, the less stress on the eccentric, it's, it's much less taxing on your body to do it with the lightning method. That's why I was trying to stress to you, um, Miss. It's the overspeed eccentric that's going to make your throws farther because it's going to build a greater stretch reflex. Not to mention, it's going to last longer. It will last longer and it will produce a greater stretch reflex. Yes, sir. We might have reverse hydras. I mean, what would you, uh, for a throws, what would you like recovery on that heavy? You need to do reverse hypers. I'm sorry, go ahead. 80% within a reverse hyper situation get a kid that's uh, going to peak, say, in March. When should we, uh, you know, throws coach, you know, stop them? you like to apply the, the heavy method? <laughs> Always. You know, you live on assistant exercises, okay? So why would you dump the most critical part of your training before your most important event? So I had a kid that's, you know, half his max is like 405. So we're like 200 pound, on what? Squat. Oh, okay. Okay, well, if he can squat 405, he should probably train on a reverse hyper. A straight pin. If he, you say he squats 405? Yeah, no, he's 205 squatter. 205? No, no, he's 405 squatter, but half of that, correct? Yeah, that's right. That's right. You got it. About 200 pounds right around in there. I would do, four, I would do three to four sets of 10. Sometimes I would hook a band in the front of the rack and go around the pendulum. The weight's going to come way down. Three months more uh, contraction in the lower back. He won't be able to get as high, and switch it around like that. Okay. Is your reverse hyper done at the end of the workout, or is that the close up? Okay, both. <laughs> I warm up with heavy reverse hypers, um, and then at the end I do heavier reverse hypers. Uh, you know, I, I I'm a, a huge fight fan. A lot of my friends are MMA guys. I mean, you can't wear one out, but they go out there. If I actually warmed up with them, I wouldn't be able to go to the ring and get my butt kicked. You know, I'd be dead in the dressing room. And the same thing with a lot of people. What you know, you, I'm in condition to do this type of warm up to go out and uh, and lift. So you want to be in condition to do a good warm up. It should not. And I'm warming up the vital muscles that's doing the lifts. Like my guys, um, I got this from throwers overseas. Now, a lot of my guys are doing four sets of 15 in a modern dumbbell. My, my George Haberty weighs 204. I just watched a Canberra bar bench 515 in a T-shirt. He's broke 11 world records. I, on my last tape, he bent 635 in a T-shirt, weighing 235. All right. He could do uh, four sets of 15 of 155-pound dumbbells like all day long. It's not, even, it's not even hard for him. But he uses four sets of 15 with 85s every other day. He, and I, I, he told me it's made the top of his bend stronger and the bottom, he feels bulletproof. It's raised his general physical preparedness. It's added muscle mass on him actually without went, uh, gaining any weight. Yes, sir? Single arm cleans with the dumbbell. What do, you, what do you think about that? I think it's a little dangerous if, you, if you're a good, you know, if you could teach him to do it. I'm more into jumps than I am cleans. But, um, you know, absolutely. I was telling a few people last night that I'm a big opponent, a component, or like to see people do power cleans, power snatches, and squats off their knees. You get down on their knees. I have a fellow in high school, he, he, uh, high school did, he threw 170. He's at Kent State now, he threw 179 this year as a junior. But in high school, the more he could jump onto his feet with the bar on his back, the farther his throw went. In high school, he did 155. Now he's done 255, and he's thrown 179 this year. Uh, that's the first of it. 
The second is a power clean from the knee, off the knees, while you're down on your feet, watch, like a kid watching television, power clean off the thighs and onto your feet, and then thirdly, power snatch. If you, you people have books from overseas, real books from the people that actually invented plyometrics, you don't see them do Olympic lifting. They, they, what do they do? Jumping, bounding, and depth jumps. Okay? And they do a lot of stuff off their knees like that. That's where I got it from. Can you, I'm, I'm not following what you're saying about cleaning and snatching off your knees on your knees. You get down on your knees, get down. Can you do it? Are you able to? <clears throat> right here? He's going to squat back. There you go. That's going to build some serious explosive power. <laughs> 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 I talked to throwers overseas, and they thought it was like retarded that people can't do it, you know, with at least 225. They thought that was like you're not even consider yourself a thrower. Make you jump out of the gym. Too. You'll jump. You will jump like you can. If you want to jump, you're going to jump. Yes, sir. Weight vest versus uh, dumbbell. You placed it on a box. What do you think about that? You talk about jumping up on a box? That's <coughs> Straight up, overhead lift, explosive movement, 24 inches up. What do you think about that? Okay, now oh, you got to run that by me again. So, what are you doing? I mean, every athlete stand on um, a box and then grab it. I mean, they, a dumbbell, the weighted, vest. weighted vest coming off the box. You jump off the box with that. Exactly. Okay. You should not do depth jumps if you cannot full, full squat two times your body weight. That's right. If they can do that, but that's a lot for a child. And if you read a lot of literature overseas, they only did serious depth jumps twice a year. If you also read, they reduced the cleans and pulls. and I mean, the, the pulls and the squats when they did that. You had to be very careful with it. We don't do any. We do very few jump downs. He's one of them. My big guys wouldn't allow, but we do a lot of jump ups with weight vests, ankle weights, dumbbells, kettlebells. You name it. Oh, we also have got the best results by setting on a box and jumping onto a second box. I brought an NFL lineman from the Raiders in, Pete Champion, played for five years. I uh, had him there two days. He jumped the longest broad jump he ever jumped by doing that. Sitting on a box, sit on a box, and then... He would sit, like... Hey, sit on that box and jump out through here. Just, just, yeah, I would, just... I would like, say this box is lower. Yeah, I would we'll we'll sit. Yeah, but jump. here, sit down. Sit down, do it, and jump. Just do, boom. Okay, so no, you got to stand up so you know what you're doing. You know, no, I want you to do a broad jump out. Here, uh, hey, out. sit like you do. Sit down. St out. Stand up. Stand up. Stand up. Stand. <laughs> sit down. Then jump, like you do. Yeah. There you go. Boom. Then jump out. Yeah, like that. We do it all on boxes and also long jump. Okay. Like fly on training, right? Yes. And this is using weight or just unloaded? We use weight uh, and unloaded. We test ourselves unloaded. That's how we got the guy to jump on a 59. That's how I got mine to 52 also. Yeah. You know, there's two things you have to have. And everybody in this room, there's fast people in this room, and there's strong people in this room. And there's some that's very fast and very strong. But you've got one you're going to excel at and one you're going to lack at. You have to have a fast rate of force development, and you have to have absolute strength. You raise your absolute strength, and a fast rate of force development, you're going to, whatever you're in, you're going to be better at it. Yes? Can we train cross, I mean, cross plane wise? I mean, have a kid run off a box, jump off a box, and pull an implement from the vest. I mean, how do we implement? I mean, you're talking about some type of complex training where he jumps off a box, does a power clean? Exactly. What's, is this for throwing? Uh, yes. <laughs> uh, it's tough to work two types of strengths in one workout. You know, if you fatigue a person, their explosive power is not going to be there. If you look at fighting, I'm a huge fight fan. Most knockouts occur in half the early part of the fight because that's where explosive power is. The second half of the fight, they rely on endurance, all right, and the power comes down. That's why sprinters, 100 meters, the fastest sprinters don't slow down very much. Then when they slow down, they lose. Um, you can try it. We do a lot of stuff in fatigue. He's done jumps. Some of the highest day coaches down, he's jumping on 52 after he did a, a ridiculous squat workout. 720 pound of band. I don't know how many sets uh, with uh, 235 pound of weight, 720 pound of band, 720 band and that. Set after set, 10 sets. Then he jumps on, he done jumps on a 52 inch box. That, that's, that's basically complex training. That's complex. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's right, because the same thing Charlie Francis did, heavy weights, then, then sprinting. It's a contrast. Yeah. That's what I'm, you know, that's right, contrast. It teaches you to do it super fast. It's just like I, I like to end a lot of my throw and lift, and at the end of the workout, we'll, we'll, we'll throw some medicine balls. 
it, in a way, in a way, it's a warm down, but it's explosive. We just got done squatting at you. Okay, we did our hybrids. Right, now, now we're going to throw the med ball. We're going to do ten backwards explosion throw ten overheads. That's right. The heavy stuff working its way down. It's up lighter, so it's fast. It has to work out with something fast. So all speed has to do with external resistance. More questions here? So we understand, you guys all understand the light method. I, I think you really should do a, a, try a lot of that. Like, that's like this gentleman said. He's, you'll find out the bands, the bands are great, they're the best, but sometimes the best, you know, can waste you. We do a lot of, uh, periodically we do weight releasers. You, you're familiar with the weight releasers? They go down, you take 200 pounds down, set in the bottom, the weight releaser jump off the bar and you stand back up with less weight. All right, when we, we do it two ways. We normally use about, um, with the weight releasers around 80%, counting the weight releasers, set on the box, it releases, we jump up to 60%. That's for dynamic speed work, okay? And it'll work out, they'll also do a second rep, so let's say they'll do 10 doubles, of course they're doing eight, one list with the weight releaser, because the weight releaser's off the bar at that point. We also use chain, I have special weight releasers, but the chain, it deloads systematically. Instead of everything, boom, jumping off like that, uh, we use bands and chains and weight releasers, if you've ever seen my reactive method tape. When we go down, that way it deloads proportionately. You don't have this tremendous shock. Then it jumps off. You, know, you, you use chains, so you know what I'm talking about, right? Okay. Yes, sir. You know, you were talking about jumping on boxes with dumbbells. Yes. Basically, that's like doing jump squat. That's right. Probably with less pressure on your lower back. Well, you're only, you know, you're running the air. You're just, you know, you're only clearing a box so much, so you're not having a long drop phase. And then you step off the box. We step off the box. Four sets of four, we like to do around four sets of four. And you gradually work the way from and, the, and the height of the box. We, four sets of four to 80% box. If you could jump on a 40, 80% of that's 32 inches. Pick optimal boxes. Yes, sir. Overhead work, what, what, what do you recommend? <laughs> we do overhead. I mean, the only thing overhead we do is uh, dumbbell presses and barbell presses, okay? Um, as far as what I recommend you people doing is the push jerks. The ones, the, all the throwers I've ever seen, the greater the push jerk, the farther they threw. That's exactly what I'm saying about this thing on the ground. You know, if your boy broke a record with his kneeling squat and he could push jerk more, chances are he'll throw more. You, you don't have to take him out and find that out. It's better to go to a contest with fear. You know, you ever, you know, fear is a great thing. <laughs> You know, you think you don't want to fail in everybody, and if you're trained properly, you will succeed. If you're, you know, you have to have a plan. Hey, Louis, can, can we go overhead? Can we go overhead with bands? Sure. Absolutely. And the light method is a great way. I've had a lot of colleges do a lot of power cleans with the light method, and their power clean went straight up. If, if, you situ if you're into power cleans and even the full squat, catching a bar in a full squat, if you, you can't use the bands we do, but if you use a single mini band, so you pull the bar up, and let's say it's got 40 pound hitch and jump under, your squat under will get quicker, and, you, and the fastest squat under is your best Olympic lifters. What's that change? I, my friend, um, what the hell's his name? Oh, uh, the 220 world record, what's his name? Down south? Travis, Travis Smash. Travis Smash, for instance, you know, he powerlifted world record holder in the 220s in powerlifting. He used to train Olympic lifts at Colorado Springs. Didn't do any Olympic lifts for two years and snatched, power snatched more than he ever did, first time. But right now, he's doing 10 sets of singles with uh, 314 and a power clean and 80 pound of chain. At 220. At 220. Is that too lean? 80 pounds, four, four chain. If, if you're going to do power cleans, I would like to recommend something. If you make bigger jumps, you know, the first pull, in my, in my opinion, Olympic lifts are not good for sports. Why? Because you have a controlled first pull, right? Is that true? You, the first pull is controlled, so you don't distort the second pull. That's how you do Olympic lifts properly. But you show me a sport where you got a slow first step. And I'll show you a kid sitting on, sitting on the sidelines. Up its guard, closing the hole. <laughs> I think also with the Travis thing that he was telling you too, he was doing the, the power lift and has the all time total, but he just now came back to Olympic lifting and did that. Yeah. Did no prior tra training except Westside principles. Yeah. So he's writing a thing of what he's doing right now. Way beyond what he was before. 
But Travis is very strong. I mean, front squat's 600 pounds, you know, routinely at 220. And a real front squat, he, he's, he can do it. <laughs> I would, do, I would definitely do the push jerks. I'd also try some at the light method. And I'd also try some of the bands over the bar. That's going to treat some acceleration and good lockout. Okay. I also want to talk about the rate leaders quick with max effort work. We use real heavy stuff, 400 pounds. And heavy weights. But they don't go down slow with it. They go down fast with it. Never lower bars slowly. I mentioned yesterday, we know depth jumps work. So you're moving to the speed of gravity near river around 9.8 meters per second. We know they work right, so why would anyone lower a barbell slowly? In sports, there's no reason. If a bodybuilder, that's how size is acquired, but not for sports. Fast eccentrics, like I talked about yesterday, overspeed eccentrics. Okay, I want to talk about loading. Now, you know, everybody looks at powerlifting, they think they've lift big heavy weights low. They need to come to my gym, and they're going to see some big heavy weights lifted real fast. And, but I want to talk about loading. Uh, you know, we talked about a speed day and a max effort day. If you roughly take this, and you people will use this, if you use chain, this is no trouble. If you did 10 doubles a week, that's um, 20 lifts a week, 80 lifts a month. Follow that. Max effort work I discussed yesterday. Uh, if you're doing the heavier stuff like us, you basically do one to three. You know, when you get around three, one at 90%, one near record, and try a record, maximum effort work, or a record and another record, but stop. So if you look at that, you're looking at three lists a week or 12 a month. Now, uh, here's what you have to do, and this is why it fits into sports, because you're doing 80 lists a month for explosive power, and that's what you're trying to achieve, right? And 12 for max effort. The rest of the time is developed into special exercises. They build up the hamstrings, glutes, traps, triceps, abdominals, hips, whatever you're trying to build up. Okay? So you understand that loading process? No one ever taught me loading. 1983, the first, my, I benched 480 and, uh, in 1980 nationals, which I won, and I was 17 pounds off the world record squat. But my bench never moved for three years. When I broke my back, I, I started reading about the books and started reading about their loading. Then, you know, this is no bench shirt. Then I benched 484, 490, 496. And I still thought it was a fluke. Even though I hadn't gone anywhere in three years in the bench, I still thought it was a fluke. Until I got my other guys to do it, and then I found it wasn't a fluke. And we started training. I talked to someone then with bench shirts. And bench shirts came out in 1985. But in 1993, I benched 530, which was a PR for me. And I trained with 365 for eight triples, no bands or chains. That's 72% of that lift. Two years later, Kenny Patterson, my gym, is 22 years old. He'd been 728 training with the same weight, 365.